we've heard some some interesting, um, I guess, uh, perspectives, per perspectives on a, a lot of different kind of sectors of the industry and and the stakeholders' um, points of view on everything. So what I want to do now is introduce Bill Moore to kind of capture um, more of kind of a global outlook on what BIM is um, and and what he's observed looking um, at at the. The, the earth as a whole, what's been kind of done and uh, elsewhere and how we can learn and grow from it. So um, yeah, without further ado, we've got Bill Moore here, who is the president of Building Smart, and he will be moderating the, uh, the panel discussion today. So please welcome Bill Moore. Thanks, Tyler. Um, I'm joined today with uh, some inspiring speakers that are going to serve as our panel for this afternoon's discussion. So I'll invite you to uh, grab a seat. I'm going to actually let them introduce themselves, and that's uh, selfish because I don't want to mispronounce anybody's name. <laughs> so, um, And I think it's better to hear directly from them than me attempt to describe their extensive experience in the subject. So um, I thought I'd talk a little bit about where our industry is at. Um, so obviously I have connections globally through my Building Smart International uh, role as uh, one of the board directors there. And uh, it's interesting to see how rapidly our world is changing. So when you look around the planet to see what's taking place and how quickly it's happening, it's a, it's a little bit alarming almost. Um, for example, in the Building Smart level, uh, how many people are familiar with Building Smart? Does everybody know what we do? So we're about open BIM, and uh, that's different than just BIM. So BIM is, uh, you know, a philosophy really, but a lot of people confuse it with a piece of software, often Revit, and they think, well, if I go buy Revit, I'm doing BIM, when actually Revit is a tool. Uh, in my view, BIM is really about humans, about workflow, and then least important is the technology you're using. And that's really what, in my view, BIM encapsulates. Uh, but at the global level, we're seeing, you know, and, and last year I was invited to speak here as well, and uh, I'm happy to be back. The Scandinavian countries and what, what they're doing, France is another really big player, and then Southeast Asia has is, is come on really strong, and the Chinese have done incredible things in a very short period of time. And what you're going to start to see is a lot more linear BIM, than you've seen before. So road, rail, tunnels, canals, uh, water, wastewater, that's all coming on stream in the, the, the coming weeks, months, and years, uh, where traditionally up until now, it's been really very much building centric. So we're digitizing our entire built environment, which is a very exciting thing. And I think this panel discussion beyond BIM is extremely appropriate. Because this is really talking about, okay, now that all the disciplines and all of the built environment are creating information models, what's next? And I think that's what we're going to try and explore today. So our industry has been traditionally inward looking. That's sort of how it's worked for many years. But what, and I think the important thing to talk about there is the fact that we've been very focused on budgets and contracts and completing projects on time, on a schedule. And what we're entering now is an era of what I call disruption. I call it the era of disruption. And it's disruption to our workflows, it's disruption to our tools, and importantly, disruption to our social fabric. And I think our speakers today are gonna talk about that a little bit. This is as much about human impact as it is anything else. So, um, you know, that's, I think a really important consideration. You'll probably hear some of us, certainly me, use the acronym today, uh, AECOOM. Anybody ever heard of this before? Do you know what I'm talking about? So AECOOM is architect, engineer, contractor, owner, operator, manufacturer. So it covers the whole sort of uh, stakeholder chain in terms of this BIM, uh, disruption that we're talking about. And each of these people are involved and have a vested interest in this. And the really difficult thing is each stakeholder has a different lens as to what BIM is. And the important thing is to speak to the other stakeholders in a language or currency that they can relate to. 
That's extremely important. So that's why I say the big challenges we face are really social. The technology's come so far that it's allowing us to do things that were not, never possible before. Um, I hear this often too, people will say, oh well, God, I'll be retired before any of this happens. But I think the reality is you may be surprised, and these people that say this may be surprised to learn that, in fact, you may not be retired and it may come upon you quicker than you're ready for. And I think as Canadians, it's our responsibility to be prepared and aware and making steps to you know, prepare our, our businesses and our future in this digital ecosystem. So I think that's probably enough babbling from me. I'll leave one thought with you. I did recently go to a conference where a colleague of mine uttered the following sentence. He says, we're going to experience more change in the next 50 years or sorry, in the next five years than we've seen in the last 50 years. And it, it, that really resonated with me because I think it speaks to really what's happening in the world today. So without, <clears throat> without further ado, I'd like to, we'll start with Leo here, have them introduce themselves, explain a little bit about what their experience is, and then we'll get into some of the questioning. Before we get into the questioning, I'm gonna let them introduce themselves. There's a poll I want to put up on the screen, and you can use the app to vote in the poll. So I put a question together. So we'll, we'll start with Leo, and then we'll come back to the poll. Hello. Thank you. <coughs> Hello. <laughs> test, test. Hello. Thank you for having me uh, this afternoon. Um, so I work for Pomelo as, a, as innovation man manager. Uh, Pomelo is a general contractor and we're doing a lot more uh, alternative, pro alternative projects, design and build in IPD. Uh, and we're across Canada, so uh, in, for my experience, I, uh, I have a background in architecture, master in, in construction engineering, and I work on a lot of complex projects, um, healthcare projects, hospitals, airports, and also um, for office buildings. So I'm specialist also for BIM, in uh, for facility management. Hi everybody, thanks for having me. My name is Chad Gendel and I'm project manager and facilities director for a cannabis extraction company building out a 16,000 square foot uh, state-of-the-art extraction facility in Edmonton. Uh, my background is in construction management. I worked for Shandos Construction in Alberta for about five years uh, and where I was involved in delivering the two first publicly traded IPD uh, schools um, in Red Deer. So I've been exposed to a lot of BIM. Uh, we use that tool very, very uh, effectively on those projects. And I've brought that methodology to uh, our new facility construction. Um, so we're really trying to integrate it from start to finish, use it in uh, making sure we have an existing building, so we 3D scan that and got to work right in the model from there. Um, we're intending to use it as an operational uh, and facilities management tool on the back end, and we also intend to 3D scan the building again before we even uh, put the drywall on so we know exactly where everything is as built as we go along. So. Um, you know, my passion is to really try and, and get us to that next step. You know, IPD was very much a, a good step in the right direction. However, it, it doesn't fix some of the key things uh, that we we're facing in the next five years. So thank you. I'm Scott Harlack with Next Architecture. I have 13 years experience. Um, several years before that, I was in the construction industry actually doing the work. Um, next is a established upstart we've been around for three years and we've completed several buildings um, we are our main goal at next is to disrupt the industry we feel that it's broken and it needs to be fixed um, um, we don't have any titles in our office like bin manager or anything like that so i'm just a worker that deals with work which you guys probably call bim <laughs> <laughs> I'm a virtual construction manager at Modern. Uh, I feel bad now. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I've worked in both our Toronto offices and our Calgary offices. Modern Niagara is, uh, um, we, we have offices in most of the major centers in British Columbia, um, 
Alberta and Ontario. Uh, we have a mechanical and an electrical sub uh, contractor arm. Uh, our mechanical arms probably our largest, and we also have a controls division. So we're uh, we, we we do a bunch of sub trade um, uh, work across a bunch of different regions. Uh, personally, I've worked on uh, the Calgary Cancer Center, which is I'm leading that job right now. Uh, it's a 1.8 million square foot hospital that's being built um, just on 16th Ave in, in, in Calgary. And I've also worked on a few hospitals in Toronto as well as office towers and even the Edmonton Police Station. So um, I look at things through a specific like sub trade. How do our installers install? And how can we prefabricate? Uh, and what can we prefabricate? Excellent. Great. So what I'd like to do now is to, I'm going to put the poll up on the screen and invite each of you, to, if you haven't already, to vote on the question that we put together, which is, what is the single greatest barrier Saskatchewan must overcome in order to digitize the built environment? So you have between now and the end of our session to, uh, to vote on this, and we'll see what the outcome is. Uh, in fact, I might leave this up in case you get bored listening to us. <laughs> All right, so uh, <clears throat> what I wanted to do is start off with a line of questioning here. Maybe I have to turn it off. <laughs> um, <clears throat> my first question is to the, to the panelists, and I would like to invite the audience, if you have thoughts on this, we'll run a mic out to you and, and let you chime in as well. But my first question is, and I'll direct this one at, um, uh, let's start with Leah here. Uh, what do you see as the greatest, single greatest obstacle industry faces in order to transform the way we work? The single, the first one is the human factor. If you have all the technology that you can have and you have the money to do it, you have to have an open mind to uh, integrate that in your uh, processes and in your business structure. Um, and it's also about teamwork. You cannot do it alone, and then you need your partners, your all the stakeholders to do it with you. And you cannot just do it on, on, on your corner alone. It doesn't work, and uh, you won't have any return on your investment. Good. So, Chad, I'll ask your perspective on the same question. Yeah, I think it has to do with uh, contracts and agreements for sure. Uh, typically, the contracts might create an abrasive way of delivering a project, so to speak. And so for me, I think identifying the workflows and then creating a contract that makes sense for the stakeholders is, is another uh, direction that we need to go in. Great. I'd agree with Chad Stop. that contracts are probably one of our greatest risks is that we can't work in a collaborative environment if our contract is not collaborative. I also believe that who manages the risk is one of the other ones is contractors are not risk managers. They will up prices just to manage the risk when someone like mechanical or architectural are more or best better suited to manage the risk that we are touching. So. Chris. <laughs> I think it's. I think we're at a stage right now of um, making an organizational structure that interacts with BIM throughout its entire organism. I think if if that's one of the biggest challenges I see as a sub trade, because we're at this nexus where, like, we, uh, on the project I'm on right now, we have a hundred plumbers, and some of them were born fifty years ago. They don't want to talk about BIM and all that stuff, and making an organizational structure that works with that and complements that as well as pulls it, pulls it forward is, is a very hard thing to establish. Um, it's hard to get buy-in. And um, the flip side of that, that's like the, the pull. But I think as a BIM, as a, 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 a someone who works with BIM daily, is our, our as a sub-trade, our degree and level of perfection has to be extremely high. So like back in, like in, in using other businesses, like metrics are part of that. What are our expectations of quality? How are we vetting our quality? How, how are we doing that? And how are we always delivering a good quality, quality project? I think that's the challenge of the sub trades. Yeah, okay, great. Audience have any questions or thoughts about that question? Anyone have, no one's willing to 
raise their hand and contribute here? Okay, we'll come back to you. The next question I'm going to direct at Scott, and that is, what sort of behavior change do people have to practice in order to successfully <clears throat> manage disruption imposed by this new way of working? I think the behaviors we need to change are the standard finger pointing when something goes wrong or who is managing the rest, like I said before. Um, we, the behaviors of, lost my train of thought here, sorry guys. It's just, it's, it's the environment and the behavior that we're changing is, we need to work as a team. We, we say we're co collaborative and how we're using BIM to collaborate with everything else, but when we finally get onto a project with consultants and team members and owners, and no one wants to be collaborative. No one wants to give their model out. No one wants to say, oh, that's proprietary information. You can't have that. Why can't we? Why, cannot, why can we not share? Let's, let's get back to the playground and share our toys with everybody. <laughs> yeah. Good. All right, the next question I'll, I'll direct at Leo. Do, you, do the available technologies support the aspirations of digitizing our built environment? Yes, it does right now. However, you need to know how to use it and when to use it. And also to have the manpower within your organization to be able to provide training. Different organization has a different level of maturity. So it's all about knowing what type of technology will work for you and what you need within your organization to be able to deploy it and then to use it properly. It's not because VR, it's so, uh, it's so trendy right now that you have to use it. If you don't know why, and you just wanted to use it because it's flashy and, and it's glamorous, then it's for the wrong reasons. Uh, it has to be um, uh, profitable for your workflow, and uh, it has to be efficient. So yes, the technology is there. You have to be also open-minded to integrate it and to integrate the change within your uh, uh, your your business. Good, great. One of the things I was going to, uh, I guess, pose out there is, you spoke to training and training your staff. What what my experience has been, and I'm sure others share it, is you can send somebody for training, but you have to pick the right people to manage this transition because it comes down to not only the ability to sit through a training session, but have the out-of-the-box thinking and the aptitude to take these technologies and make them do what we're trying to achieve. Well, I have something to say about that because our superintendents, it's not because they, ha they are 60 years old that they cannot integrate the technology. I uh, have the opportunity to work with uh, one superintendent that is very open to lean construction and to integrate that with our technology and the auto automatic planning. So he is full on, he knows how to use an iPad. He's like, it's, it's just technology, just show me what button to push and I'll do it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the other superintendent, he's 30, he's super young, he doesn't wanna know anything about it because he knows everything. So it's not about age. <laughs> <laughs> it's not about age, but it's, all, it's really about your, 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 your willing, willing, willingness to, to change and to integrate what's good for you. And also, it's mostly about n not knowledge, but what's in it for, for, for me. Um, if he knows that it will make his life easier and it's simple to use, like, like downloading an application and it will take you 30 seconds to know how to use it, then they will not say no. Okay. Um, the, the next question I want to ask, I want to direct to both Chris and Chad, so whoever wants to answer it first. But my question is simply this. Does a bid-build contract support this new way of working? I, I saw your question sent Wednesday, and I'm, I, what do you mean this new way? When, when I'm talking about the new way of you working, yeah, well, digitizing our built environment, right? So to me, digitizing our built environment, it, that's past what I would traditionally see as BIM is like, which, which as a subtrade, we focus very much on geometry, because if we don't get our geometry right, uh, the installation just falls to pieces and the BIM initiative falls to pieces. So um, design, bid, build, uh, pertaining to that, it's complementary. Basically what we do is we, we 
we look around a building. If, if it's a bid spec and there's not BIM specifically asked, we'll go and look around the building for our high value items and we'll apply the technology to that. And if we see low value items, like uh, plumbing is my, my background, like my, the, the strongest understanding, a half inch copper fitting that you solder, we'll, I'll talk about it more now than our plumber will take to, to, to plan it and implement it. So there's very little value there on some buildings. On other buildings like hospitals where there's just so much stuff everywhere, we actually do go down to that level of detail on everything. So um, to bid, but like a non-specified BIM bid spec, we would choose where to apply it and we apply it, you know, intelligently and we, we, we'd see value in doing so. Um, in terms of digitizing, we would never do that for free. There's a lot of risk right now. It's, it's, it's definitely the Wild West. We, we're, we're having trouble for even figuring out how to encompass digitizing all of the assets that we install. It's scary. So we're, we're, it, that would greatly affect us on a bid spec. I think our numbers would be too high. And I think the value would be because like every time you say to an owner, I got weird numbers, they're like, oh, OK, don't 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 include that in the number. Let's see if we can break that out. Do, does that make sense? Yeah. So that, that's how I see it as pertaining to bid spec. It's a wild number event. Yeah. And when I say digitizing the built environment, what I'm talking about is just to provide the context is changing from a two two dimensional delivery traditional approach to this new fully three dimensional enriched with information uh, and used beyond construction type of approach. What, what air handling unit have we installed? And what's its voltage? Why is its horsepower what it is? What's its CFM unit and all that jazz? That, that's expensive to go and write down in, in, in anything other than a submitted shop drawing. It gets expensive for us. Um, in terms of creating things like in 3D, like the actual build, the active building, our companies, um, we're using, uh, we're trying to increase monthly or yearly on our, on our uh, our use of 3D technologies, we do use it heavily and we're looking into really exciting stuff that I think there was a talk about today with Victaulic. Um, there's a tool where, uh, which I think is just really neat in terms of the BIM philosophy as a whole, where we're issuing con concepts of 3D and there's no drawings. So the, the, the users in our shop get to spin around their own models, which I think is great because now it's becoming democratized. Like it's, it's, it's across the whole gamut of our workers in, in our company. Thanks. Yeah, from from a traditional method, I mean, our CCDCs that we all have seen, we've all been a part of potentially, I don't think that that type of a model will work moving forwards. Um, you know, I think we want to get to a point, IPD is a good way to go about it. However, some of it, at the end of the day, my experience at Shandos implementing IPD, by the time we had everybody's pricing in, the whole contract, all the bid documents done, it was a 500 to 800 page document. But who's gonna go through a contract like that and who's gonna really dive into it at all times, right? So um, getting down to a point where maybe we can get to below 10, 10 pages and then have the supplementals be a part of the 3D model that you're delivering um, that also takes uh, sophistication from the owner. So from my side, you know, I have all this experience coming from the GC, so I've seen that, that double-sided coin, but it, how do we go about um, really educating the owners to say, this is available to you. Here's the benefits as to why you wanna go about it in this way. Um, I would always suggest that uh, especially in, in the cannabis industry right now, what's happening is, is there's really no schedule or pricing certainty because we're flying the plane as we build it. You know, the buildings that we're building are very highly, uh, they have a lot of really interesting utilities that go into them, lots of power requirements, lots of mechanical. So to have that coordinated in a 3D uh, delivery methodology is something that's very important. Um, and even right now, like at an ASTM one budget, it's still plus minus 5%. So I got to carry something to make that up on the back end, just in case something goes wrong still, you know, uh, so from a, from a traditional methodology, I think we should 
throw those contracts out the window um, and really look to uh, some of the other countries that have these templates already built, like the UK, like some of the Asian markets and, and uh, so on. So uh, traditional bid builds, uh, maybe we can shift the bid to the front, right? If we're looking at bringing a team together to deliver a full 3D methodology throughout the whole delivery system, you still kind of go about it in a CM sort of way. Give us our, your schedule of values. Give us what you want to be paid. What's your profit? What are you worth to the project? And what do you bring? Um, those are the types of conversations that we need to have up front to change what the contract is going to be on the back end. Because uh, the way that the contracts are written right now, there's, there's no room for really collaboration at the end of the day. Um, so that for us, um, we're still going about it in, in a C, with a CM. Uh, could it be better? Yes. Um, is it there uh, yet? No. But using the tool to its full potential is something that has to be driven down by the owners. Because uh, at the end of the day, if, if it's just being put in there for show or, or for novelty, you're never gonna, it's never going to be used to its full potential. Um, so we really just want to make sure that throughout the whole life cycle, we can integrate it from start to finish. Yeah, great. So I popped up the uh, poll here so everybody can see where we're at. This first line of questioning uh, was all about industry obstacles. And it's interesting to look at what all of you have to say about what the obstacles are. And it seems social and human behavior at 68% is by and large the most commonly perceived obstacle. So I think we all, the, all of the panelists spoke to that. So I, I think, yes, yeah, <laughs> yeah, contracts, <laughs> contracts, yeah, contracts came in at 12%. We spoke quite a bit about contracts saying that was an important consideration. It may not be as important as is viewed by many of you. Uh, technology interoperability at 15% is quite interesting. That's a, a perceived barrier. Uh, regulators and authorities being 3% and an other. So I'd be interested to know more about the other. Anyone want to share what other might be? Nobody's going to speak up. Fair enough. All right. So what I'd like to do is shift the line of questioning now to collaboration. Talk a little bit about that. So I'll direct this question to Scott, maybe, and that is, with the world becoming ever more connected and the global community collaborating more and more, what should Saskatchewan stakeholders consider related to CDE and cloud collaboration? So CDE, Common Data Environment. Everybody heard of that one before? This is hosting an entire project on a cloud platform. So Scott, floor is yours. What you guys should be looking into or being prepared for is Cloud isn't bad. You're not going to lose your files. You're not going to hit cyber threats and all that. It could happen. It can happen at any point. Um, the data that is coming out of our models is so immense that in one day, the data that can be produced would just blow your mind. When you look at what companies like IBI and what they're doing with their data and using it to, to produce spreadsheets and, and dashboards that say that they're, they're saving X amount of money per clicks on, on, on software, um, we, we have to start looking at how we're using our cloud models and how we can use the internet and the internet of things to start um, getting materials already bought by the owner or by the, the group in themselves as, as the team and, and just pulling that data from your model that can be used to automatically purchase, right? And, <clears throat> and um, when, we, when we take that data and we start using the internet to, to produce the information that is pulling from it, it just becomes that much more great. Great. So the next question I want to direct at Leo, and that is, in today's market where organizations work on projects with teams distributed across the country, across the province, across an office, many offices around the world, 
uh, how do you manage projects in which multi-disciplines are using different products from different vendors and we're all trying to build one holistic facility? So it's it's our reality we we work with a lot of um, consultants architects engineers they all have their own software we we'll work with a lot of sub trays that have their own software as well structure is tecla um, cad maps for all mechanical so we are um, developing a, a, a unified platform to be able to integrate all types of source of uh, 3d visualization and also communication uh, I recently, well, I'm still working on, on this project in, uh, in uh, Fort McMurray for Willow Square. And it's a design and build project. Um, all the consultants, uh, designers are scattered around the country. And uh, I'm a specialist in FM and I'm, I, I, I work for Montreal. And we are having uh, conference calls every two weeks. Uh, we are exchanging files through uh, BIM 360, and uh, they are also designing through BIM 360. So a lot of technology and platforms is there, uh, are there to, uh, to help you communicate, but you have to be able to use it, and then to use it on time, and to use it uh, when, uh, to share information as well. Um, we also have uh, modelers for, for 4D simulations, for example, and we have to, you know, like, cut the, the different models to, uh, to do 4D simulations. So this type of modeling uh, is, uh, is done in Asia. So the, the, the time difference is one thing, but uh, they're working throughout the night when, when we sleep. So it's, it's also good um, for, for productivity. Um, technology is there and uh, 5G is, is coming up. Uh, sharing big models will be faster also and easier for, for all. <laughs> Oh, we are taking technology uh, for, for the best, and sometimes it doesn't work, but we have to test it out and then try pilot projects to, with people that are as open-minded as us to, to make, sometimes make errors and know what to not repeat. Excellent. Good. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit now, and I'd like to talk about Reality capture, also referred to as point cloud, 3D scanning, LiDAR. It's got all kinds of names. Uh, just to show of hands from the audience, how many people have experience with point clouds? Oh, that's good. That's good. Oftentimes when I ask that question, very few hands go up in the audience. So that's a good sign. Um, so my question I'm going to direct to Scott. How does one get involved with laser scanning if you don't have any experience? Well, with all the hands that went up, I'm just kind of... Yeah, it's going to be a fine question. Um, you don't need to go and buy the scanner and think that you need to spend $100,000 to be able to go and scan a building. There's companies out there, and there's lots of them. I think, imagine it's doing it. They're here today. They will go out, and they'll scan your building. They'll stitch it together. They'll give you a Revit file. They'll give you the point cloud file. And what you're doing is linking it in, and you're spending your time using that cloud to model your building or get just information of what's truly there or if there's an issue with a slab being sloped in the wrong way or you have you know an inch depression on on a slab where you're putting in uh, movable walls that have a quarter inch tolerance so you don't need to do a huge amount of work as long as you're using the software and you know how to use say revit when you're bringing in the point cloud there's other companies that will support you and do the scanning for you yeah. Uh, so I, I'm going to throw a question out to our owner, <laughs> which um, is really, what is your view on point cloud work? I think it's essential uh, to the construction uh, process, especially in our in our view. I mean, we're taking in a building, commercial building that was built in 1979 when we're absolutely just completely retrofitting it with extreme amounts of electrical and mechanical to be put in. So for us, 3D scanning the building was essential for us to make sure that the Revit model is accurate and it, avoiding the whole thing of spending more hours for a consultant to go to site, measure it, do a sketch, get it in, and then you know we find out we're two a foot, two feet, 
tolerance, whatever it might be, because he sketched it wrong. So, I mean, we can avoid all of that headache right up front uh, for the existing conditions of a building. So I think it's essential moving forwards for any type of, of building. Even, even before you get onto site too, if you have a completely new green build, uh, going on, you know, now there's topographical uh, scans going on. Um, you can look at that. So I, again, I think it's essential to the whole whole process. Right. Okay, so maybe Chris, I'll ask you this question. If you get a point cloud from a contractor that you've hired to go out and scan your site, when you get it back, is that all you need or is there more to it? Uh, it the answer would be it depends. Uh, I, I believe that like, BIM, like everyone's heard the 100, 200, there's a continuum of quality. So depending on what we get, I, I believe personally, and, and I think our, de our department does across the country, that there's usually value to be gained from anything. If it's a really great point cloud or if someone's been kind enough to, to convert it to Revit, that's amazing. Um, but if it's a sort of, it's missing something, there's still usually value there. So. Yeah. It, the answer is it depends, but it, like anyone who gives me one will take it. Um, when it comes to our own cost, it's it's simple like a value calculation. Like and it doesn't take long to get the payback, right? right? As you said, we can spend a lot of money having people drive to and from a site, and usually there's a second drive, and usually there's a really unclear communication that happens back at the office with the person that wasn't there. Like all that can be completely destroyed with even a bad point cloud okay. so <laughs> I, it's 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 a value calculation yeah. if we have to do it but there's usually really there's something good there somewhere yeah and, and the, the the thought provoking behind that question is really and you alluded to it in your answer is when you get the cloud back you made the comment that if somebody converts it into a revit model for me that was the point i was trying to make is with the question is that if you get a cloud there's not a lot you can do with just the cloud other than reference it and there's a lot of effort involved in turning that into geometry, right? So that was sort of the, the impetus of that question. Um, what I wanted to do now is ask Liu here, uh, how can reality capture help in all the steps of the life cycle as we are traditionally surveying only at the beginning of a project? So first of all, you have uh, different types of uh, reality capture. Yes, for sure, you have the point cloud but you can also have a model uh, from photogrammetry uh, taken with the drone. So it's, it, it depends on what reality you want to have and what you want to follow up. Uh, during construction, for sure, you want to see the progression and all the status of your, your work. But uh, not, only, not only photogrammetry or point cloud is, uh, is reality capture, you can also have pictures, you can have videos, and then you can also have 3D pictures and 3D videos of your specific uh, job sites. So this, uh, this reality capture depends on what you want to do with it, if you want to compare it with what is designed compared to what is uh, built, and uh, to ver verify the quality as well. Uh, the quality of the, the installation, uh, the location of what it was coordinated uh, versus what it's installed. Um, and at the end, all this data is really useful for the owner. when. When uh, all the walls and the ceilings are, are closed up, then you can go back to the history of uh, all your captures to see what's there. Excellent. Um, that, I mean, you, you bring up a great point, which is the photogrammetry. So for those that weren't able to sit on Drew Teal's presentation earlier today, he showed a little product. Uh, I think he said it was $50 a month. Uh, it's called Recap Photo. And you can go out with your iPhone and take a bunch of pictures on site and it'll stitch it together and create a three-dimensional view of your photos, which is a very useful tool. So and photogrammetry it where it is and on, georeferences on it. Yeah. 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 So it's, uh, I mean, there's other, so as you pointed out, other means of reality capture. Um, so what I'd like to do now is shift to data and start talking about data. So now that we're able to collect this immense volumes of data with point clouds and models and all of this statistical and information, how are stakeholders expected to manage this immense volume of data? So I'm gonna ask each of you to answer that and if you wanna start, Liam. Um, a lot of data, a lot of uh, not useful data uh, throughout the life cycle of your project. 
um, it depends on on what you need and then what you ha you can man maintain as data throughout the time. Um, for example, I know I for, as for owners, you don't need all the all the all the design data. You need equipment. You, all the structural information, the model is there and it will not change, it's fine. Yeah. So you have to know also the data that you can ma maintain and what you need and how to access it. Um, a lot of inf information is like not enough as well. So you have to know where to, 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 to go lean with it. Yeah, exactly. I think I'm going to echo a lot of that is, is trimming the data that we really don't need as the end user at the end of the day is, is something, you know, how a, a mechanical air handling unit, how much CFM, what's the life cycle on the filters. Um, it's those type, that data is, is important, um, especially when we look into the utility systems that I'm installing at the facility. I have glycol water chillers and uh, hot water tanks and uh, pressure vessels and uh, liquid nitrogen cooling uh, going on. So those are the big pieces of equipment for us that the data would be really important as the end user. So uh, really just trimming that out and working collaboratively with the designers to say, okay, what do we need and what is the data that we're going to use at the end of the project? So. Yeah, I agree with that. I think as an owner or a stakeholder, you need to invest into an FM, a facilities management software, that's going to actually use your data. And if you have QR scanning for your equipment that's in your building, and you can actually pull up what your maintenance schedule is, is it essentially comes down, just use the data. Find a way that it's going to be stored. I can't speak on data storage because I don't deal with that. But use it. Don't just let it sit there and keep referring back to your 2D documents and your drawings and going, well, that's how I used it before, so I'll just keep doing that. Let's use the data that's, that we, as, as the industry, have painstakingly put into our, our models. And don't just rely on CAD 2.0 as, as BIM, right? It's, it's, there, it's there, use it, find some software that would allow you to, to use it to its fullest. Yes. I would defer to your answer, because you probably know what you need more than I do. Um, as an owner, uh, I, I actually wrote down, grab as much as you can, throw it in a bucket, because the algorithms that deal with too much data are gonna come. Uh, so if, if you're in a construction site and you've got it, I, would, I, I do appreciate like, the, the lack of existing ability to digest, but I, I do believe that like, you know, we're gonna see things develop in the next five years that are gonna help us digest. So there's two, there's two forks, right? Like there's the fork of what we know now, and then there's the fork of what the future is going to bring. Yeah. I, would, I would do an aggregate dump, grab as much as I can, take everything, but I would also, uh, as a sub-trade, try to find out what it is the owner wants and deliver specifically to that. Excellent. And that was a, a fantastic segue, by the way, Chris, into the next section, which is really about beyond BIM. What does the future look like? What does it hold for us? And where is all of this taking us? So um, uh, the first question, and I'll open it up to any panelist that wants to or feels they uh, have a comment on it. And that is, which technology trend do you think will have the greatest impact on the AEC OOM industry in the next five to 10 years? Will it be augmented reality? Will it be artificial intelligence? Is it cloud computing? Is it 3D printing? Is it the internet of things? What will it be? Well, I just want to continue on, on, uh, oh, on, on Chris, uh, Chris, right? <laughs> Chris answer. It's, it's, it's true. A lot of data it will be useful. However, if data is, is, you know, like just thrown like that in a bunch, you will have a lot of work to undo it. But it's, it's, it's a, it would be a great practice to structure your data logically. So when you want to go back uh, to use uh, artificial intelligence, for example, all the algorithms, uh, it will be easier and faster for you if your data is, is already structured in a, in a logical way. Um, so for, to answer your question, artificial intelligence a lot. And also all the data capture, uh, Internet of Things, uh, all the big data, it, it will be um, a disruptor. 
Okay. Anyone else have thoughts on that question? Which is what's the single biggest thing you guys, you feel is going to impact the industry in five years? Yeah, I think AI. Uh, you know, adding to that AI for us definitely in the operations of our facility and that AI learning will be very important, especially with our equipment that's doing the processing. Uh, when we have our model integrated into our building operations uh, and maintenance, we will be able to link that to the operation of our pressure vessels, of the temperature spikes that you'll see across the board. And so when a different cultivar of cannabis comes into my facility, basically the AI learning will tell us, okay, this is your your cultivar that you're bringing in. These are the parameters we need to set your whole system to to extract um, correctly and then from there we get a feedback loop on our ERP system to then say okay well these are the impacts of to your accounting to your warehousing to your inventory um, so there is definitely that trickle down effect uh, that can be used uh, through AI and and a bunch of that learning excellent yeah, I would echo what you're saying. The Internet of Things is going to be massive when it comes to AI. And I think deep machine learning will be one of the bigger ones is as AI becomes smarter, which Terminator and all that kind of stuff is a little scary. But it will be those, those little tasks that we do that can be done a lot quicker by someone that doesn't have to do it. And it's just done instantaneously by a machine or by machine learning um, for our field surf, sor, uh, field workers and our, our like as a sub trade I would say I would answer the question as it pertains to time right now I, we're seeing amazing feedback uh, and, and value out of the cloud like uh, just changing from like standard Revit to cloud-based Revit is oh my god so so many hours have been saved like thousands that's huge. So I'd say cloud is now. AI is probably the next. Augmented reality. I see that happening. I think of it as like again, cost thing. Like, what, how how long will it take for us for it to be reasonable to get augmented reality in our workers, uh, like all of our workers? I see that being five years um, because you've got five G with that. So five G has to be implemented, and then we have to go into the cheap zone, which is nice. Then we'll adopt it. <laughs> <laughs> well said. Yeah. Uh, then well I, said. I thought that smart cities probably weren't within your five-year range. So, good. I have one more thing to add. Sure. I think that um, using the model will also allow us to pre-manufacture, uh, get away from wet materials on site. Uh, one of the biggest pain in the butts is uh, concrete on site. Um, and if you can bring that inside to a pre-manufactured facility, um, 3D printing will also supplement that. So just all of that combined will definitely push us forwards on site. Yeah. So if you were to give some advice to the Saskatchewan audience about what steps they might consider taking in order to prepare themselves for the ever-changing rate of change that they're experiencing what would your advice be so any one of you that feels you want to answer that question um don't be afraid of change and don't be afraid of the machines you <laughs> um have an open mind and and willing to learn everything new has to be easy to, to use otherwise nobody will use it so for me it's really the mindset and to make it simple and um uh, I'm in charge of innovations uh, in, in, in our organization. And if, if it's a little bit complicated, for sure it's not a good solution. So make it easy and have an open mind for change. Uh, that's what I can say. So I think too, it comes down to some education on uh, all of our parts in you know why are we doing this essentially what we're doing up front is we're taking all of the back end stuff that we would solve on site or figure out then or move to the back end where i need to now pay the subcontractor the gc the architect the sub consultants to do all that work so i have like kind of like a rule of five whenever you're on site you're gonna you're gonna pay five times more for any change or any mistake 
that you have. And if you bring that to the front end by implementing uh, BIM, you might pay more up front, but something for the owners to understand is if you do that, you're gonna save so much through your life cycle of the, of the construction to, to the end use. Um, numbers are scary up front, again, with CapEx. I mean, oh, we don't wanna spend that much money right now because you know, paying someone maybe an extra $50,000, $100,000 to, to go down that road is maybe scary up front, but at the, at the back end, I won't be hit with a $100,000, $200,000 change order that now we're all fighting over and you know, the profit on there is allocated wrong or, or whatever it ends up being. Um, you know, case in point, the two IPD schools that I did, uh, we, we signed a, a contract for 50, 53.3 um, as a maximum upset. We came in at 48. So all of that cash got put back into everybody's pockets. And then everybody was making between 10 and 20% profit. Who makes that on a job nowadays? No one. I mean, you, you know, right now the GCs are going in really like 1%, 2%. We all got to eat and we all got to make money doing this. Like, why would we do it if we're not going to collaborate and make money so that we can all live, you know, good, continuous um, and, and prosper moving forward? So I think from that perspective, uh, the education of upfront, why are we spending the time now? Why are we spending the money now? Well, guess what? If you do that, you get into your building sooner you get in the GC and the architect and everybody else can go and build another building sooner so they can keep going. Um, so planning on the front end and not just picking the lowest price because <laughs> I, always, I always find it so funny. You know, you go and buy a Toyota for really cheap, but you think you're getting a Ferrari. How did that, that doesn't work. Like that's the same thing in the construction industry. I mean, how can you expect that the lowest bidder or the lowest price is gonna give you the, a good quality delivery methodology, so. On change, I would say just like you said, embrace the change, it's gonna happen. Um, the community that we are here is a fantastic community that are willing to help. Ask questions, go on forums, don't be afraid to reach out because everyone will help you. There'll be, you'll get 100 responses to your question because everyone wants to see this industry change and become better than what it is. So don't be, don't be afraid. Well, everyone who helps will help us, at least us. Not a lot of help. Start early. Yeah. And convince everyone upstream of you and downstream of you to start early with you. So if you've got a new data thing you're trying to fight with, like uh, the construction industry is really got a, a bad tradition of starting late because that's traditionally how you make money. BIM is not that, there's, there was a curve up on the, I think the first presentation or the second presentation, start early. That's where the money is. So I would be remiss if I stood up here and moderated this entire panel and failed to ask a question about open BIM <laughs> as the representative of Building Smart. So my question is, what is the importance of open BIM for Canadian stakeholders? The openness just allows everyone to, to make the changes that they need for themselves or their company or their client and be able to get the information that's there and not be handcuffed that this software or this platform only does what it does and you can't change it. It's kind of like, you know, like an iPhone. You can only do what the iPhone does, but you go to an Android and you can change it to your heart's content. So the importance is that you just, you're, you're able to, to move forward. Every, someone else has a different idea than everyone else and it could just be, it could be, it could be changing. It could change the whole industry by just one person being able to pull the data from some, something that's, that was open. Anyone else have thoughts on that? When I say open, I'm talking about like IFC and MVD and those sorts of things, which is an open exchange format that allows you to move data and information from platform to platform without saying, as an owner, this project needs to be delivered in Revit or something like that. It's an open exchange format. So. Well, it allows a higher collaboration with uh, diff all the stakeholders. Uh, as you said, architects, engineers, construct uh, contractors, owners, um, operators, and manufacturers. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> 
So we, we all use different platforms for, for our own needs, for our own uh, business structure and uh, uh, processes. And, and it's really important to be able to exchange information and to visualize it properly uh, when you need it and have access to it easily as well. Excellent. So it's, it's higher collaboration and it's a better integration of all the, all the data. So just show of hands, how many people in here are using non-Autodesk products? <laughs> Exclusively no, but... Yeah. So, I mean, that's one of the, the conveniences we have here in, in North America is Autodesk has done such a good job that the majority of us use Autodesk products. So therefore, when we work with one another, uh, it's much easier, although not super easy, much easier than it could be if we were working with Tecla and Archicad and Bentley and all of these other products and trying to put a team together to work. And that's where OpenBIM comes in. So, I think OpenBIM is also important because if information is left to the side because they're not talking together and that information goes you know, without seeing or, you know, the data doesn't transfer over. There's some liability there in that you're, you know, the data isn't being shared. So in my view, if the data isn't shared or the info isn't shared to somebody, that's a breakdown in communication, um, which means, you know, maybe it does get built wrong. Uh, so there's that risk as well. And I think the open, open uh, model really makes sense to, to bridge that gap. Excellent. There's also productivity. If, if you cannot access the, the, the data, then you will have to recreate it somehow. Yeah. And that's rework and that's, uh, it's, it's a waste. It's, non, it's a non-added value action. Absolutely. Excellent. So what I'd like to do now is open it to the floor if anyone has any questions for the panelists. We'll take questions. Sure, can we, anybody able to run a mic around for us? Thanks, Bill. Um, there are a, a few owners' representatives uh, in the uh, audience, at least there was uh, earlier um, today. I'd be interested in. Uh, words of advice uh, directed specifically at, uh, at owners from uh, each of you. All right. <laughs> owner to owner, you get to start. <laughs> get somebody who knows the construction process on your team immediately uh, if you're going to move into a project and get it delivered. Um, that's essential because, it, I mean, when you talk to people who aren't in the construction industry, they don't know anything about it. And so being somebody, you know, maybe for an example in the cannabis industry, you're somebody who um, is, is a horticulturalist, you're a chemical engineer, you're a mechanical um, consultant, you know, there's, there is a need for owners to get more sophisticated and bringing that expertise on. So as soon as you think you're going to go and build a building, get somebody either in-house and hire them immediately or contract that out. And look look for people who have experience with, with, with 3D or, or BIM um, because that'll even just add another asset to your, to your delivery uh, because they've been able to work with it, see the advantages of it, and then bring that view to the project team. Good. I would also say start slow. Don't go into a project demanding that you want Kobe and an asset management and, and you want the whole works right off the bat and have you never done it before because you'll just end up dying and choking from all the data that you're getting and you're going, what am I doing with this now? And I just spent a ton of money to get this done and it doesn't help you. So little bites. I think is the best way to go by it if you're if you're just getting into it as an owner. I would start small as well as slow. Yes. The I, I, personally, I think that the the data like we're 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 seeing Kobe as a thing that's on our second or third project in Alberta. We're hearing about Derofis as a sub trade. The, these things aren't ironed out yet. They're they're going to be. 
and it'll be exciting. It'll be very valuable to the owners. But I would go into these things wide, eyes wide open that even if the software is mm -hmm. right, a lot of your subtrades have never done this before. So, so go into it eyes wide open, small, slow, work with the team partners across the whole, like the GCs, like vertically, work, work with everyone and yeah, and, and make a plan and be prepared to fail, but don't throw out the baby with the bathwater because eventually you'll get it right. And I think you're gonna find something that actually defends your portfolio and gets you an extra two or 4% that you're looking for. Um, lastly, I think uh, it's mostly to be clear on your on your specifications and and what you want in your project. Um, most of the time, it's it's a lot of mis misinterpretation of, of what was asked and what was uh, bid on, and uh, at the end, uh, you don't un well. Not everybody will interpret the the information the same way. Um, just a, an example, my, my ex-husband is, uh, is an accountant. When we were about to buy a condo, um, he didn't understand a floor plan. He's like, why this line is a door? He doesn't understand it. He's like, why is it, how, how it can be like, why this is a door and everybody understand it and not me. So it's, when, when you're not in the, in the construction industry, uh, we have this language, we have this, this understanding of, of that line with the, that, that curved thing, that's a door that opens that way and then, but, <laughs> so it's, it's about communication. So be open to understand another language um, and also start, start, start small and, and with a variety of, of different projects. You can do like a renovation, an extension or a total new building. It's not the same way to process uh, or to work with BIM. So it's, it's, it's to try out a variety of, of different situations and that's how you can understand the whole process better and, you can, and that's how you can see all the benefits that goes with it, not only for you, but also for the people that you're, you're gonna work with. Great, good. So uh, I think we've reached pretty much the end of our time slot. So I would like to thank the panelists for their insight and perspective, if we could give them a round of applause. And I'd like uh, to thank all of you for staying on a Friday at the end of a day to come and listen to what, uh, what we had to say and what the panelists had to say. So thank you very much for that.